Um, as Morgan said, my name is Kristen Heitzinger. I'm um, from USCDC and I'm the chair of the country level surveillance subgroup. And I'm really delighted to be here. Good morning and bonjour, bon dia a todos. Um, it's a great pleasure to be back in Mozambique where I spent a couple of years of my life. Um, so very happy to be here. Um, as Morgan mentioned, I'll be presenting on the GTFCC recommendations for surveillance. So just start off. So first off, I'd just like to provide a bit of background, um, first regarding the importance of cholera surveillance, secondly, provide a bit of rationale for why the GTFCC recommendations are being updated, and then third, um, a bit of information about the revision process and the timelines for that. So I won't go into too much detail on this slide because I know you saw it yesterday, um, but just very briefly, I think we're all aware that surveillance is really the cornerstone um, of ending cholera and meeting the target of the global roadmap um, to eliminate cholera uh, in 20 countries, uh, ensure that there's no more uncontrolled cholera and then reduce deaths by 90%. Um, and the two specific axes that surveillance um, is essential for is access one, early detection and quick response to contain outbreaks, and access two, which is um, enabling the targeted prevention strategy of uh, working in cholera hotspots. So just to reinforce the message a, a bit, um, surveillance, of course, is also critical for all of the pillars um, in that, you know, early detection and quick response to contain outbreaks affects really all of the actors involved in response. Um, secondly, uh, it again facilitates targeted prevention strategies, um, notably the identification of PAMIs for the development of NCPs. And then finally, um, enables monitoring and evaluation, um, as a, you know, essentially progress, uh, measuring of progress towards outbreak control and also impact of interventions. So why the update of the GTFCC recommendations for caller surveillance? It looks like there's <laughs> an icon that isn't showing here, um, but nevertheless. Um, so the 2017 GTFCC surveillance recommendations did not provide adequately fine scale or an accurate picture of the cholera situation. Um, the guidance includes uh, aggregate reporting by age groups, um, which is not, of course, particularly fine scale, and also has some limited guidance around laboratory testing. Um, but the view of the, of the surveillance working group was that this could be approved upon. Um, it also did not address the diversity of cholera epidemiological situations and the corresponding surveillance and control objectives in that the cholera epidemiological situations in those guidance were dichotomized just based on whether there was presence or absence of a confirmed outbreak. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, and just to, oh, did I do something wrong? Oh, there it was. Okay, great. Um, yes, and so therefore a priority of the of the surveillance working group and specifically the country level surveillance subgroup um, has been to update the GTFCC guidance uh, around surveillance to better help countries um, achieve the target of the global roadmap. Oh, there we go. Um, so just a bit about this process and the timeline for it. Um, I think as some in the room are undoubtedly aware, um, at our surveillance working group meeting in April of last year, there was some discussion of the guiding principles um, for the GTFCC surveillance recommendations. Ah, there we go. Um, Following that, of course, there's been a tremendous upsurge in the seventh pandemic strain, um, which has really provided additional impetus for the updating of these recommendations. And so in February 2023, um, the interim GTFTC surveillance recommendations were, were published, 
um, which we, I think were tremendous um, enhancement of the previous version. And in follow-up to that, um, the, the subgroup will be working on compiling comprehensive GTFCC surveillance recommendations by the end of this year. So I'll get into a little bit of the details on that um, later in the, in the session. So in terms of the objectives of this session, um, first I'll present a bit about the GTFCC interim recommendations that again were published in February and really just highlighting the key changes. I won't get into the details. Um, I'll also be excluding the details on testing strategy because Mari Laura and I will be presenting on that tomorrow. Um, also talk a little bit about the future directions for the next update, just to say some of the revisions that um, the subgroup has planned uh, for the comprehensive GTFCC recommendations. And a second very important uh, purpose of this session is to hear from you, um, given that you know we would very much benefit from your collective experience in um, cholera surveillance and your comments will be taken into account by the surveillance working group um, in the next update. And as you'll see, there's also a portion of this presentation that talks a bit about operationalization of the surveillance recommendations. And so it will be great to be able to hear your perspectives for implementation as well. So to provide an overview of the interim GTFCC recommendations, um, I'll talk a little bit about the key objectives and principles, um, definitions and operationalization. And just noting here that um, if you haven't checked them out already, uh, there are English and French, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> versions of the of these recommendations on the GTFCC website. All right. So key objectives and principles. All right. Um, so again, this was uh, noted at the surveillance working group meeting last year. Um, but just to refresh everyone's collective memories, a lot has happened in the interim. Um, some of the principles around uh, where we are headed in terms of cholera surveillance are first to maximize the operational use of cholera surveillance data, which means using an adaptive surveillance strategy at the local level. Secondly, we'd like to increase the accuracy of cholera surveillance by using systematic strategies for testing. And then third, uh, we'd like to increase the resolution or granularity of cholera surveillance data using case-based surveillance. Okay. So I'll just describe those three just uh, one by one briefly. Um, so in order to maximize the operational use of surveillance data, um, the uh, interim recommendations um, aim to have surveillance objectives and modalities that are adapted to the cholera situation at the local level. And by local level, we mean the surveillance unit, which may mean um, the administrative unit no bigger than an NCP operational unit for countries that have NCPs and maybe country specific based on that. In terms of the cholera situations described in the interim recommendations, um, there are two, uh, the absence of a confirmed outbreak and then the presence of one. In terms of objectives for the absence, um, we're really aiming to rapidly detect, investigate, and respond to suspected or probable cholera outbreaks in order to interrupt um, the establishment of local transmission. And then in the case of a confirmed cholera outbreak, we'd like to monitor morbidity, mortality, and the affected populations in order to inform interventions to mitigate, mitigate the impact and spread and eventually end the outbreak. In order to increase the accuracy of surveillance, um, there are systematic strategies for testing that are adapted to the cholera situation at the local level um, that are described in this guidance. Um, and these include expanded RDT use for early outbreak detection and outbreak monitoring, alternative recommendations for laboratory testing if RDTs are not available, and then uh, more specific recommendations than in the previous guidance regarding culture and PCR. Right. 
Um, in terms of the case-based reporting and data analysis, um, the intent of this is really just to increase the granularity of surveillance data so that it's available with enough um, detail to be able to inform interventions at the local level. Um, so that will be a minimum requirement in, or is a minimum requirement included in the February 2023 interim recommendations. So just taking a, a quick look, comparing the, the previous recommendations with the current interim recommendations, um, as I mentioned before, uh, the 2017 recommendations included the aggregate number of cholera cases and deaths by age group, uh, less than five and old, and then five and older, um, and then moving towards, oops, sorry, case-based data um, to be collected and reported for all suspected cases. And then in terms of analysis, um, in the previous recommendations, data was consolidated and analyzed at the district or the national level. And then we're now moving towards analysis at the surveillance unit level. So a much um, lower uh, level to be able to inform action on the ground. So in terms of just some, some definitions that'll be important for later discussion. Um, we have a suspected cholera outbreak, which in the interim recommendations is defined as two or more suspected cholera cases that are reported in the same surveillance unit within one week of each other, or one person two years of older, two, two years of age or older, um, dying of acute watery diarrhea with no other specific cause attributed to the death. Um, or one confirmed cholera case that's pending case classification by origin of infection, meaning be it locally acquired or an imported cholera case. Um, in terms of a probable, probable cholera outbreak, this is a new definition that was not included in the 2017 guidance. Um, but this is an outbreak that's detected when a certain number of suspected cholera cases with a po positive rapid diagnostic test within a two-week period in a surveillance unit exceeds predefined thresholds. So I know that's kind of a mouthful, but essentially, you know, looking at the number of positive RDTs over the number that's con that are conducted in um, a two-week period. Um, that's used to define thresholds for a probable cholera outbreak. And um, I won't get into too much detail here because we'll be discussing it more tomorrow, um, but these thresholds are statistically determined to provide a high level of confidence that at least one of the suspected cases with a positive RDT is in fact a cholera, a true cholera case. And the idea behind using this uh, definition is really just to maximize the use of RDTs for rapid response, taking into account the fact that RDT performance specifically, the, the specificity is, is not as um, high as for other types of tests. So in terms of um, confirmed cholera outbreaks, um, this is defined as at least one confirmed cholera case that's locally required, acquired. So just underscoring the point here that if there is an imported cholera case that is not, um, does not meet the definition for a confirmed outbreak. And then a uh, final definition, which is the end of a cholera outbreak, um, defined as a suspected probable or confirmed cholera outbreak that can be considered over when for a, a period of a minimum of four consecutive weeks, all suspected cases, if any are tested, had a negative laboratory test result by either culture or PCR. So just with those definitions to kind of lay the groundwork there, um, we'll move on to operationalization of this. So again, um, you know, this strategy is adaptive but that doesn't mean that it's unstable or that every aspect of it is, is variable. There's both a stable aspect, aspect or a static aspect and then also flexible elements. So just to highlight um, some of those for the stable or the static elements, regardless of the cholera situation in the surveillance unit, surveillance should be um, inclusive of operational surveillance streams, so specifically health, health facility-based surveillance, community-based and event-based. Um, the data collection reporting should also be systematic, 
and routine data analysis of key surveillance indicators um, should be conducted. In terms of the flex flexible aspects that um, that may be a bit newer um, compared to the previous guidance, um, the modalities uh, are adapted to the pre prevailing cholera situation, um, specifically the case definitions, the testing strategy, and the frequency of reporting and analysis. We'll talk a little bit about that as well in subsequent slides. So in terms of the case definitions, um, again, in, in these interim guidance, we're considering two situations, either the absence or presence of a confirmed cholera outbreak. So in the absence, um, we'll consider a case, a suspected case, as any person two years of age or older with acute watery diarrhea and severe dehydration or dying from acute watery diarrhea. Um, so basically consistent with the 2017 guidance. For confirmed cholera outbreak, um, our suspect cases are any person with or dying from acute watery diarrhea. Um, in terms of testing strategies, again, just give a very brief preview of what's to come tomorrow. Um, but for a situation of an absence of a confirmed outbreak, um, the guidance is to test all suspect cases. Whereas for in the situation of a confirmed outbreak, um, testing of a subset is uh, according to a systematic protocol is for the, the recommendations. In terms of the frequency of reporting and analysis, in the case of uh, absence of a confirmed cholera outbreak in a surveillance unit, then reporting will be reporting and analysis is to be daily to allow for early outbreak detection. In the case of a confirmed cholera outbreak, um, reporting and analysis should, analysis should be at least weekly um, in order to monitor the outbreak. And this slide just gives a quick uh, summary of what I just described. Um, so you can see just the core modalities and the adaptive modalities that change based on the situation. So, now to move towards what we're currently working on and uh, get a little bit into the future of this work. Um, so the comprehensive GTFCC recommendations that are in progress. So our goal um, in moving from the interim recommendations to the comprehensive recommendations is essentially to enrich and to complement what the, the guidance that already exists. Um, and these will be consistent um, with the principles of the February 2023 interim recommendations. So we have here a few ideas for how um, we plan to enrich these. So specifically further differentiation of the cholera outbreak situations in a surveillance unit, including how they articulate with the requirements for cholera free status. Um, secondly, identifying a situation of deteriorated community transmission for investigation and an increase in response efforts for control, just recognizing that that is a situation that's a bit different than um, other types of community transmission. Um, third, providing additional guidance and practical tools a bit along the same lines of um, the PAMI guidance and tools that was presented yesterday. Um, to better facilitate data collection, reporting, and analysis. Um, also, provision of recommendations for monitoring and evaluation of surveillance performance, as that will be taken into account into the caller free status um, framework as well. And then finally, um, hearing the feedback from countries um, between now and, and when those uh, recommendations are published so that we can account for that um, in terms of how these revisions go forward. So just to kind of briefly touch on each of those points, um, one of the differences between the interim recommendations and the comprehensive recommendations that we're working towards is that we're going to be separating the category of confirmed cholera outbreak into two, um, one being clustered cholera transmission, um, defined as uh, a confirmed cholera outbreak with confirmed cholera cases that are all epidemiologically linked. And then uh, the second uh, outbreak situation, which is community cholera transmission, 
in which confirmed cholera cases cannot be all epidemiologically linked. So that'll be one difference that we'll talk about in, in a little bit. Um, in terms of how this articulates with the, the requirements for cholera-free status, um, so for the situations of an absence of confirmed cholera outbreak or the clustered cholera transmission, this is considered as an absence of community transmission for the purposes of the status, the cholera-free status framework. Um, and given that cholera is in that situation eliminated as a threat for public health, it does not um, prevent either the recognition or the maintenance of cholera-free status. Um, a situation that's a bit different is that of community cholera transmission, which would lead to a suspension um, or revocation of cholera-free status, except for the situation in which the community transmission is, is limited, um, either, well, in space um, or time. So it would be a, a situation of community transmission of less than two months um, and limited to one surveillance unit. So um, in terms of the operational objectives, um, I just want to draw your attention to the two uh, uh, situation, the two cholera situations um, at the bottom of the slide. So for clustered cholera transmission, um, it's an objective that's very similar to that of the absence of a confirmed cholera outbreak. Um, so to rapidly detect confirm, investigate, and respond to any cases to contain transmission, um, prevent com community transmission and, and the outbreak. Um, whereas for community cholera transmission, um, the goal is what was described for the situation of a confirmed outbreak for the interim recommendation. So again, to monitor morbidity, mortality, um, and affected populations to mitigate the impact um, and spread of the, of the outbreak. And again, there's... Uh, the adaptive surveillance modalities that I touched on previously that um, each are, are described for these cholera outbreak situations. So as I alluded to previously, one aspect that will be that we intend to incorporate into the comprehensive recommendations um, is that of a deteriorated community transmission of cholera. Um, and this really just acknowledges that um, this type of situation indicates a breakdown or a failure of control measures um, or interventions and warrants a field investigation in order to increase control efforts. There are a number of indicators of that can be used to define a deteriorated community transmission situation. Um, notably incidents uh, above the expected historical baseline level. Um, and those of you who participate in the country level surveillance subgroup know that we've had some discussion around the methods for that, and we expect that that will continue um, <laughs> in the coming months or so. Um, another indicator is spatial spread of cholera beyond the initial focus of the outbreak, higher increasing case fatality ratio, and then finally a shift in the demographics uh, sociodemographic characteristics of cases and deaths. Um, so just to note a bit uh, the additional guidance and tools that uh, we plan to develop for data collection, reporting, and analysis to better facilitate the opera operationalization of the comprehensive recommendations um, are listed here. Uh, we plan to develop a line list template, case investigation form, and also a template for routine um, epidemiological reports or, or SIP reps. Um, and we'll also noting that we'll ensure consistency with the requirements for reporting and data flow from local to regional and global levels um, that I think will be described in the afternoon. So in terms of recommendations for routine monitoring and evaluation of surveillance performance, um, we also plan to include in the comprehensive recommendations um, a note on key epi and lab indicators and targets to enable the continuous monitoring of surveillance performance, um, such as completeness, timeliness, and, and others. Um, given that surveillance is really just so important for, for early detection and other objectives of surveillance, um, 
I think that this is really essential to have these indicators to enable um, troubleshooting of issues and improve surveillance in real time. And then second, there'll be minimum performance targets as a part of the requirements for cholera free status. So those, these two documents will articulate. Um, we'll also provide recommendations for the periodic evaluation of the overall effectiveness and impact of, of the surveillance system. So the slide um, really just summarizes uh, the interim recommendations and uh, the changes that, that we plan to um, make to improve them. So again, differentiation of the two situations of what we previously referred to as a confirmed cholera outbreak, um, inclusion of deteriorated community transmission, supporting tools to operationalize this, and then um, uh, indicators for, for uh, monitoring and evaluation of surveillance performance. And again, just noting that we have English and French uh, translations of these recommendations available online, and we'll continue to assess and perhaps from uh, thanks to your feedback, we may be able to determine whether or not an additional language or, or more are needed. So a big thanks to all of the subgroup members who were really um, did a fantastic job in contributing to this work and a special thanks to the writing team who was most engaged um, in developing this these recommendations in February. So thanks very much for your attention. Happy to take questions or comments. Please go ahead. Oh, my um, I have to sorry to make the microphone more fifty six to switch one off. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, thank you very much. It was a very useful presentation for us, and I am from Afghanistan. We are having AWD slash cholera, uh, and this, the number are very huge. Just from the last May 2022 till now, we detected and recorded like 280,000 cases of AWD slash cholera. Uh, well, uh, when there is a particular localities or provinces in, in the country and you have suspected cases, uh, is beyond the capacity of the country like Afghanistan. It's very difficult to do RDT or test all the suspected cases. Uh, so how this uh, guideline is flexible to adapt uh, testing a subset uh, of the suspected cases using RDT. Thank you. <laughs> we will discuss that in detail tomorrow. Um, I'm not... Will you be here tomorrow? <laughs> okay, fantastic. Then I think I'll um, put that one on hold at least until then. But thanks for the question. Good morning, all, and thank you for the presentation. I have two questions. The first one is about reporting frequency. When there is no outbreak, we say the report should be daily. And when we have an outbreak, it should be weekly. I don't understand the rationale which is behind because in our practice is when we have an outbreak that we do active case finding and the report should be daily. And the second one is about rapid diagnosis test where <clears throat> it is not really clear when you have a person with a all the symptoms, but when the test, the rapid diagnosis test is negative, how are we going to proceed? Some country presented and they say for each five rapid diagnosis tests negative, they collect to do culture. But in our own setting, when it is negative, we just stop to the, the, the process. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for, for those questions. Um, so for the first one, um, yeah, I, I understand, you know, the daily reporting when there is an absence of an outbreak. Um, I think there, the idea is really to be able to at least have those data to be able to know whether or not something is happening. And there is actually some information in the recommendations that state that, you know, if there's zero reporting that's done on a weekly basis, um, but I think the idea is that 
you know, you will want to know immediately if there is a case that's identified. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> Right. When you have a positive case, it's a positive case. Not when there is not an. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yes. Thank you. It's a bit confusing because when you have a confirmed case, it should be an immediate notification. So even if you have an outbreak, the notification should be on a daily basis to fill the lie listing and to follow the evolution of the outbreak. Now, when there is no outbreak, we can we have weekly basis aggregated data saying we didn't have any suspected case of cholera. So yes, I want to understand why it's not the case here. Thank you. Um, perhaps I can explain a bit and then you know to leave for Morgan if you um, like to add as well. So if there aren't any cases, then the zero reporting would be on a weekly basis. Um, but as you mentioned, there is immediate notification in the case of a detection of a case. And so in that way, like the, the unit of time for reporting is on a daily basis. Yeah, uh, well, actually, I'm not sure if there's a need to compliment to me. Your answer was uh, super clear, Kristen. But indeed, the daily reporting in absence of a confirmed outbreak is only if there are suspected cases that happens in order to be timely and to promote early detection. During the weeks where there are no suspected cases in an area with an absence of a suspected outbreak, then zero reporting would be weekly. Then when there is a confirmed outbreak, the recommendation for weekly reporting is a minimum. It should be at least weekly, at the very least. Of course, it can be more. I hope this line. Well, just, just maybe to to uh, to uh, to hit the nail on the head. This is a minimum requirement. Okay, so the thing is, uh, not all countries are at the same level. So I totally we totally agree with you. I mean, in an outbreak daily reporting. Uh, analysis because it's not just about reporting should be uh, should be ideal to think it in some countries this is feasible in some country we are miles away so that's why the the, the weekly reporting set as a very minimum but if you can do more much better <laughs> And now when the test, the rapid diagnosis test is negative in front of a person who has all the symptoms. So I think we'll just go back to the slide that talks about the frequency of reporting, um, just as a, you know, to, uh, as a reminder of, of that content. And then to your question about the RDTs, um, again, I think I'll defer that one until tomorrow, just in terms of the specifics of that, but I have it you know, well noted here. So thank you for that. Yep, so you have a question in the middle. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. So, no, for, for, for the diagnosis, we'll see uh, again tomorrow for the, for the testing strategy. I just want to stress uh, that because sometimes we have the confusion. If an RDT is negative, uh, which is done, I mean, RDT or other confirmation uh, or, and confirmatory test are done only for surveillance purposes and never for case management. Okay, so uh, a case who present the, the, the symptom will have to be treated based on symptom and not in terms of uh, you know uh, whether the test is positive or not, so that is really important to remind. Uh, it's not like for other diseases where you want to confirm all the cases. Huh? So the, the 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 it's just a surveillance tool, and it should not should not 
influence the way people are going to be treated, whether they get IV fluid or whatever, for example. Uh, I don't think it's the case in, in, in Cameroon, but we have seen that in a number of instances. So. See a question in the middle? Oh, sorry. Marilor, did you want to say something? Uh, yes. I just wanted to say that to remember uh, to everybody that we, we will have the sessions concerning the lab tomorrow. I am sorry. I know that we, you have many questions concerning the lab, but um, new people also, a specific lab will arrive tomorrow morning. And uh, so we will discuss that. So. Don't be frustrated. I don't know the <laughs> frustrated. <laughs> okay, but uh, we will, we will uh, discuss all these points uh, tomorrow on, tomorrow and after tomorrow, so two days. Great. Um, again, oh, sorry, Morgan. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation and the updates. I have two questions. What about people, uh, children less than two years of, or of age? Because during Lebanon, the outbreak, we had uh, we had a lot of cases under two years, which were, and they were they have been confirmed as cholera. Mm -hmm. So how can we catch this uh, age group, and uh, what is the direction for this age group? Mm -hmm. My second question is about the, when we want to go to the end of the outbreak, uh, in the criteria to have at least four consecutive weeks with uh, tested negative or suspected cases, mm -hmm. but is is there any is there any minimal number of tests to be done on a weekly basis? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for for those questions. Um, so for the first one, I'm just going to go back to one of the earlier slides. Um, so so yeah, as you can see here, right um, when there's an absence of a confirmed cholera outbreak in the surveillance unit, we will not be considering um, as a suspect case. Um, children under two years. However, once the outbreak is confirmed, then they are counted and, and taken into account in the case counts. And then um, for the minimum number of tests, you're referring to RDTs or? Okay. Um, and it was the minimum number of tests. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the, in a certain period of time to conduct. Uh, the end of an outbreak. Okay, great. Um, well, again, I think I'll I'll defer that one to to Marilor's presentation and Mar Marilor Marilor and my presentation tomorrow. Um, but I'm noting it here so that we can address it then. So appreciate the the interest in this topic. Yep, please see. You. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I would like to emphasize on the issue that uh, was raised by my colleagues from Afghanistan and Lebanon mm -hmm. regarding overreporting during the outbreak. Mm -hmm. uh, when we use this case definition, any person with or dying with uh, these symptoms, mm -hmm. we have an overreporting. Mm -hmm. uh, we are reporting number of cases be, uh, below five years of age, and we know that there is are different causes of uh, diarrhea uh, among children. Mm -hmm. So uh, when the country strict to this case definition, they are criticized from the donor community of overreporting. And we need these numbers to estimate our supplies. And again, we are criticized uh, that we are over-reporting and these numbers of supplies are not the true um, number needed in case of cholera outbreak. Mm -hmm. uh, so how to uh, have like an accurate surveillance data through using of RTTs? But again, there is a global shortage of RTTs. Mm -hmm. So how to, to tackle this issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, just so I'm sure that I have it straight, you're you're being criticized for using the confirmed cholera outbreak definition, case definition. Any person? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Countries are reporting only admitted cases. Other countries are reporting severe cases. But when they report the uh, cases regarding this case definition, they uh, end up with over-reporting. So that's why they are criticized. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, a great point to raise. And I think that really gets at the question around the accuracy of the data and how we plan to address it with the testing strategy. 
See a hand way in the back there? It is inevitable that uh, over-reporting has to be accommodated. For countries like Somalia, where I've been working for the past five years, we've had laboratory confirmation uh, by school culture of positive, uh, positive cholera cases among children aged below two years because of the feeding practices by their mother where they, <clears throat> they use contaminated water to dilute their feeds. So as a country, we adopted the case definition of any person aged two years and above with three or more loose motions in a day. If we have a confirmed cholera case in any location, we disregard the age group because we have challenges of using RDT in remote areas because of stockouts. We also have challenges of early detection because some areas are very remote. So for us to be able to capture as many cases and as early as possible to initiate response early, that's why we accepted to accommodate over-reporting. But over time, as we build capacity, we have started screening those children for rotavirus, and there is evidence of rotavirus infection. So as the surveillance system for cholera grows, the health workers are being taught how to eliminate the positive cases uh, of rotavirus because uh, the RDTs are becoming more variable. So we are advocating for using RDTs on as many cases as possible. And all those negative RDTs in the meantime are not included in the line list. So we began from a highly sensitive case definition. And gradually, as the system is growing, we are improving the quality of data. But based on experience in complex emergencies where you don't have access, where the reporting is, it is better to use a more sensitive case definition to capture those cases as early as possible, regardless of the over-reporting fear. Because if you use that specific case definition only for the limited age group, you risk underestimating the need. Because every other time we are always uh, caught in between a, a rock and hard place because you were so conservative by eliminating those many suspected cases and estimating need, and you end up with our stockouts at the early of the outbreak. So it needs to be considered at country level because different countries have different situations and different capacities. So if the country is difficult to access, I would probably think that we must be as uh, expansive as possible, regardless of the fear of overreporting. Thank you. That's um, well noted and appreciate the comment. Let's see another hand in the middle. Oh, sorry, Morgan, do you want to go? Yeah, just so we don't forget about our online participants. Uh, I think one participant would like to make a comment. This is Andrew Baguma. And then we also have an online question in the chat. The question online, and then um, we'll take someone in the room. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Maybe the person online is in the room as well. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi. Yeah, I was trying to, to break my hand since a while, so that's why. <laughs> um, I just wanted to know uh, that there's few new definitions that are in the interim guidance. Uh, the probable outbreak definition, the locally acquired transmission, the clustered versus community transmission. I was wondering if you have tested all these new definitions um, with the outbreaks that were declared last year. There were 30 countries that were suffering outbreaks and obviously this offers an opportunity to know whether these definitions are applicable and whether they add value in terms of the approaches from countries to um, make decisions about how they need to handle the, the epidemic. So I was wondering if there has been already a pilot of testing of these definitions with past outbreaks or whether you are planning to do so, considering that the guidance are currently interim. 
The other consideration is that um, the classification of others primarily relate to the geographical scope, so locally um, acquired cluster and community. And uh, in the IA 2030, the immunization strategy 2030, there is an interesting definition as well that is large, large disrupted outbreaks uh, that speaks more to the magnitude of the outbreak. Is the outbreak big enough to disrupt you know, um, the health system in a given country? I was wondering if there has been any consideration to, to align with this definition that is already part of the IA 2030. Um, so to your first your first point um, around the testing of the case definitions, given that these uh, recommendations were only published in February, we haven't yet had the opportunity, but I think um, one of the purposes of, of even the session is really to um, sensitize countries to the existence of this guidance and then um, solicit their participation in actually using them to, so that they can actually provide that feedback to us so that we can improve um, for the next version of the recommendations. Um, if you wanted to add anything on that, Morgan? Okay. Okay. Um, and then for the second point, um, that is not something that we had necessarily considered. It sounds like what you're describing may be a, a concept that's similar to the situation of deteriorated community transmission, but I'd definitely be interested in learning more about that so we can consider if it would make sense to align. So thanks for those comments. See a question in the middle. Thank you. Uh, um, I would I would like to go back to that age age criteria for case definition. The notification is done by clinicians. If you tell clinicians that you have two case definitions for suspected cases, one during the outbreak, one out, outside the outbreak, it, it will be confusing for them. So we have to be very simple with the clinicians and the hospitals. It's because with different case definitions, you will have chaotic and you will not be standardizing things. This is one point. Second point, you want also to understand why this under two years old having this irritation and dying. So we need to investigate them. We need to know what are the pathogens behind these deaths and complications for the under two years old because this is reflecting the country infrastructures for the water testing, water safety. And also, also, we need to maintain the capacity of the laboratory to do testing for cholera, because cholera needs specific media. So if you tell people for the under two years old, don't do uh, culture, don't do testing, only if you have two years and above, you will you also you will lose capacity, really capacity of the laboratories. So my of the suggest, my suggestion is to, 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 to remove the age criteria and the case definitions so we can uh, we can uh, improve the knowledge for the under two years old pathogens. We can improve capacity of the laboratory and it will be very simpler for the clinicians to, to detect cases and to report them to the health authorities. Thank you. Thanks very much for those comments. Um, so maybe first a question with regard to the first one. Um, so you mentioned for clinicians, it can be difficult to consistently um, classify cases um, if the definition changes. Is there experience with other diseases that leads you to have some ideas about how that could be addressed? For example, I don't know, a job aid or something along those lines. Um, I think the, the point is well noted, and I can appreciate that additional support might be needed to operationalize um, the guidance. No. So other comments? Yeah, we have uh, a question on the chat, but first I will give the floor to Fred Kabaya from Malawi, who would like to make a point. <clears throat> so um, thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, so my question basically is um, on guidance on issues of cross-border and reporting. Um, we've noted with concern that uh, in neighboring, uh, in countries that have um, districts, neighboring districts that have outbreaks, the cases come from one country into another country. And then those cases are reported in this country. 
and occasionally even mortalities, increasing the case fatality rate for that country. And sometimes one of the causes is late reporting coming from this other country into another country. And therefore, but in necessarily increasing the CFR, which in most cases it reflects badly on this country which is receiving the cases from another country. So my question is, what is the guidance on how these cases should be reported that are constantly coming from other countries overburdening another country? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. You want to take that one first or you? <laughs> well, I think it, it likely comes down to the amount of time that the people who are traveling are actually in the country where they're going to determine whether or not they were likely infected in that place or not. So that would be my thinking around how to accurately um, report what country the burden of disease is attributed to. So this is a very good question, Fred, but I think this is a question that we are going to discuss this afternoon about, uh, you know, regional uh, uh, and, uh, and global surveillance. And very clearly, this issue of cross border uh, is something which is important because, you know, we all know that in most of the countries that are affected by cholera, the nature, the political border are not necessarily following the uh, population border. And, uh, and sometimes it's easier for people to get to the closest uh, uh, health center that can be on the other side of the border rather than the, in their own country. So, and so, so this is something that we will discuss in more detail this afternoon, but definitely, uh, you know, information exchange cross-border is critical. And the thing that we have also to be very careful of is not to single out the people that are coming from outside, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, like being the, the, the scapegoat, bringing cholera, because, you know, the things are, are is changing all the time. So, uh, bear with us. Uh, we'll have some more discussion on that this afternoon. There's one more question online, but before also to complement what Philippe just said, of course, it will be discussed this afternoon, but also to clarify the, the definition of a confirm outbreak is about one case locally acquired. So in case it was imported from elsewhere, this will not correspond to the definition of a cholera outbreak in the country where the case has been detected and confirmed. The question online is about, again, definition, and it's definition of a suspected outbreak. The question is um, about the rationale for using a, a cutoff of two cases, and why not one or three or other cutoffs? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I think that this probably owes is is due to the known infectiousness of cholera, and so likely one suspected case would not be indicative of a suspected cholera outbreak. The question of whether or not you know three or four would give you a greater um, amount of confidence that it's actually cholera that you're seeing, and I think you know. Um, there may be some subjectivity to that and difficult to know if you don't know the underlying burden of, of diarrheal pathogens in the particular area. Um, so certainly I think that, you know, could be debated, but um, you know, a number of two should provide um, a sensitive definition so that you can actually detect cholera if, it's, if it is occurring in the area. Yep, I see a question in the back. Yeah, thanks. Um, I actually just wanted to build on uh, Francesco's comment and make a recommendation. This is a work in progress, right? And I feel that we've heard from at least five countries here that are suffering with cholera, that there are questions around this. So I would propose or make the recommendation to the working group that you really should dig into some of those countries and find out how this would actually work. And coming back in June, maybe at the annual meeting, 
having one or two of the countries present, I think would be very useful. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's an excellent suggestion. I think we'd be very open to that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, good morning. And my name is Simola Tebe from Zambia. Um, I, I wanted to ask on, um, on the tools, surveillance tools that uh, you, you did mention that they are, they are programmed to be, that's the work you are about to undertake. My submission is that um, I think countries are at different levels and uh, our experiences in using tools from whether it's paper-based, Excel-based or DHIS2 or electronic form should somehow be made easier. Uh, um, thinking aloud is um, maybe some of these tools need to be simplified and not to have multiple tasks from um, notification, the issues of case investigation, line listing. I think we can have one, one system then that can capture um, a lot of those functions once entered at, um, at just a singular time rather than having multiple, multiple tasks. So thinking ahead, I think it's a tool that needs to be electronic in the first place and that can easily be accessible by many countries that uh, are participating in the, in the program. That, is, that will be my submission for now. Thank you very much. That's that's well noted, and you know definitely the importance of streamlining these processes um, should be beneficial. And I think we'll get into a little bit more of those details um, in the listening to countries section session later this morning. So thank you for that. Any other questions or comments? Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, for these important uh, guidelines and other things. Uh, I appreciate uh, Duncan's comment. I think there are so many things need to discuss and decide uh, by all other countries. So it would be good uh, if we share with these things and tested some countries and then decide all these definitions and other things. And if you consider the, these slides, uh, earlier it was only one confirmed cholera cases with, within one week. But now you, you have added two or more suspected cholera cases. I think it will debate or it will maybe question from a, a different country to countries. So I think we should restrict our earlier uh, suspected cholera outbreak definition. And also there are uh, so many things need to be uh, decided and discussed more, uh, especially the definition, RDT testing, culture testing, and other things. Uh, and also you mentioned in uh, one, one point, the end cholera outbreak, how, how you will define. You mentioned the culture or PCR uh, tested, but in, in absence of culture or PCR, so many, uh, many countries, they don't have this facility in the periphery, maybe some places in the centrally, but not. Uh, so what would be the definition or decision? And also a lot of other things. I think So it, I think it need to be, uh, sometimes to discuss more and then uh, finalize all these things. Thank you. Yeah, really appreciate um, that comment. And, you know, indeed, I think it makes sense to discuss um, a number of these aspects um, in much more detail. And in fact, you know, we're trying to get the feedback of this group and the folks online as well in order to better orient the work of this working group. And so it's very much appreciated that feedback. Um, in terms of the comment around the end of the outbreak uh, definition, so indeed it does depend on actually having the capacity to, to use culture or PCR. Um, so that could be a, lim a limitation. So thank you for the comment. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question I'm sorry. <clears throat> on data collection. Uh, it's very good to have the line list while there is uh, uh, cases of the cholera which is confirmed or suspected. But in some countries, still the surveillance is weak and the health system is fragile. Uh, it's very difficult to do the line list while there are cluster of cases, thousands of cases per week. And we had an example in Afghanistan that in one of the provinces in one week, like we recorded more than 3000 cases, but for us, it was very difficult to do the line list. So uh, like the, there, there is a need for a guide uh, or recommendation or flexibility in this guideline 
that aggregated data could also be collected just uh, like the age categories in male, female in, in the, the location, that's it. So thank you. I agree completely. And that is actually in the recommendations if it's not feasible to do case-based surveillance. So thanks for the comment. See a comment in the back? Yes, uh, <laughs> thank you. So uh, on the definition, uh, maybe uh, another discussion could be definition on endemic setting, uh, case definition on endemic setting. So uh, for instance, this year uh, in here in Mozambique, uh, we had several discussions in, on endemic settings. So we have different scenarios throughout the country. So some, some, some are considered non-endemic or low level of endemicity or uh, uh, me medium level of endemicity and high level of endemicity. So we ended up declaring outbreak of cholera in more than 57 districts, but some of them, the discussion were, uh, we will see cholera cases every week, at least one, we will see a kid that is either asymptomatic and went to, to the hospital uh, with another uh, uh, situation and end up being uh, founded that he's a uh, cholera positive on the stool testing when went to the lab. So uh, in some t and this uh, uh, brought some complication on the timing to declare outbreak on those endemic settings. One of them was Nampula. If you see the graphs uh, from Mozambique, you will see that Nampula cases uh, actually started in January, but only in March, we were able to declare an outbreak there. But this is based on recurrence of cases during this period of time. So it would be very helpful to countries and to other places to, to, to uh, work on a definition for endemic settings. And this will, will also help other groups, other pillars like OSIF implementation is a Nampula place to think about uh, our vaccine implementation with this rate of cases, singular cases, but still if you count uh, cases from January to now, there are a lot of cases. So uh, some of this definition can support guide this kind of scenario. And I believe most of the countries have this endemicity scenario uh, until they end cholera, they will still have. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, JP, for that comment. Um, so I think what you're getting at is related to our definition of the deterioration um, of community transmission. I'm just going to flip to that slide. Um, Right. And the I know that in Mozambique, they use their epidemiological data to determine a threshold for whether um, uh, an outbreak is occurring or transmission that's higher than what would be expected. Um, so do you think that perhaps there's an issue in terms of that threshold being sensitive enough? Or what would be your suggestion there? Uh, yeah, I think the threshold, it's not sensitive enough. And uh, I mean, the definition, uh, the scenario of endemicity is the problem. You know, if you say uh, Mozambique, it's known as an uh, endemic place for cholera. So how do you manage outbreak, outbreaks on an endemic place? How do you declare the, the beginning of an outbreak where you always have a case? And how do you declare the end of outbreak in a place that you always have a case. So that's the 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 bottleneck. No, I think that's that's a great um comment and certainly a point for reflection as we revise these recommendations. So Bangladesh, is Bangladesh is aligned. Oh great. Um, any other questions or comments, either in the room or online? <laughs> okay. 
Oops, maybe one more. Can I add to the discussion that, uh, of course, uh, when there's an endemic uh, baseline of cases, uh, of course, there could be a surge of cases uh, in a particular time. And that, of course, we look at whether it's two standard deviations or uh, more. So in those countries where you have a baseline of endemicity and you suddenly get a surge, we have to look at that potential surge uh, as a outbreak. So just to add to the discussion, if you want to look at I would also, you know, like to tell you that in Bangladesh, the cholera scenario is exactly like what you see in Mozambique. So there are there are a, there are a few cases around the year, but we have two distinct peaks of cholera epidemic every year. One in the uh, pre monsoon time, like our, I mean spring to summer time. And again, in the post monsoon months, like in the fall. So these are the scenario in Bangladesh. Yeah, thanks very much for those comments. Placid, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Christine. Just to make uh, a, a comment about the, the end of. Uh, outbook we 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 need to separate the, the endemic area i think for us we take a minimum of uh, eight week and uh, for epidemic area four week can be uh, necessary to to have a declaration of the the end of uh, epidemic the the outbook thank you yeah, thank you for the comment. And um, the reference to the four-week period is actually a minimum. So it sounds like in DRC, there may be a more conservative approach that's being taken. So thank you for that. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. I um, really appreciate all the feedback um, on this work, and I think we'll continue the conversations on this topic. So thanks very much.